Uh, well, today we're going to cover chapter five, um, titled Use Case Modeling, but I think a more appropriate title for this particular chapter would be uh, Fully Developed Use Cases, because uh, that's really where we're going. So we've done a lot of use case modeling already. Um, this is saying kind of the end product of the analysis phase is making these fully developed use cases. And a lot of the stuff we've talked about up till now has kind of been mostly on the, um, the things side, if you remember, we talked about um, domain classes and uh, entity relationship diagrams and these types of things. We're gonna start thinking a little bit about the process side with this, uh, with these fully developed use cases. Um, also, there are some things, again, like, you know, I kind of focus differently than the author of the text does in some things, and you'll see uh, my focus change here as well. Um, I would also reiterate that for uh, this upcoming test, which is next week, um, that I will be asking the questions, uh, again, from my perspective, not necessarily from the textbook perspective. Uh, this particular lecture shouldn't be terribly long. I, I mean, I, I would guess probably around 40 minutes for this particular lecture. Um, so what I'm going to do is I have the test ready, and I'm kind of like last time, I'm gonna go through some of the things uh, that I think you should be ready for, which of course is a week from today. Uh, because next Tuesday is the federal, or not federal, the state holiday uh, for election day, uh, so we won't have class or anything. So let's jump into it. Uh, so we did this in chapter three, and as a matter of fact, you may be working on this right now for your project, and these are the, the table format listing of the use cases where you have the use case name on the left, and then a, a brief use case description that just in a couple of sentences describes of what it does, you're not overly focused on data or process or anything like that. You're just uh, saying what this use case does beyond the label, you know, create customer account. You might include uh, under the description, user actor enters new customer account data and the system assigns an account number, creates a customer record and then creates an account record. So to jump right into it, this is what the fully developed use case will look like. So you would have a separate one of these for every use case. Uh, so if you've identified, say, 13 use cases, you would have 13, essentially, full pages of description here. And some of the future slides will go into this, but I'll run through it real quick. Uh, you start with the use case name, uh, which is something that you came up with pretty early on in the process. Uh, the scenario, so this is the setting in which this use case might occur. Uh, the triggering event, what might make the use case happen. Uh, the brief description that you've already done uh, as part of that, that table listing, um, the actors involved, um, whatever related use cases there might be. So there might be some that go along with others. Um, the stakeholders, so the people that uh, might be interested in this, the preconditions, um, so these are what have to be in place before the use case can occur. The post conditions, the things that happen after the use case happens. Um, and then this is probably one of the more important things here, uh, this flow of activities, uh, because this is where you start thinking about the process a little bit more than you might have before. You start thinking about uh, what exactly is going to happen. Uh, and from a programming perspective, uh, this is where you're initially going to start thinking about the types of algorithms that might be involved in solving this problem. Uh, again, you're not writing this algorithmically. This is not pseudocode. I don't know if you guys did that in your programming classes uh, or even as detailed as like a program flow chart. It not, it's not quite like that, but you do start breaking it down into more discrete steps than you might have seen, say, up there in the, the brief description. You know, there, there's some process implied in the brief description, uh, but it's not as detailed as it might be in the flow of activities. But you definitely start, you're thinking methodically now. Uh, and then finally, the exception conditions. Uh, these are things that might prevent the use case from happening. Um, so, you know, the basic customer data is incomplete, so they didn't enter in everything. That would stop it from finalizing. Uh, the address is invalid, so say they put in like a, a four digit zip code instead of a five digit zip code, that might uh, stop this from happening. Uh, and then the creditor debit information 
is invalid is another example of, of this particular use case uh, having an exception condition. Uh, here we see it written out. You know, I, I, I guess I've already gone through all of this um, when we're looking at the, uh, the, image of the figure from the text. This is pretty much all the same thing. Yeah, this is all exactly the same thing, just written out in text or in uh, slides. Um, so as we said before, for the use case name, it's a verb and a name, or I'm sorry, a verb and a noun. Uh, so what are we doing and what are we doing it to? Uh, the scenario, um, you know, the, the, the context or the setting by which it might happen, uh, the triggering event. Um, this kind of goes back to the event decomposition techniques, you know, things that might cause it to happen. You don't necessarily have to have created your use cases using, or I'm sorry, identified your use cases using the event decomposition technique to find triggers. Uh, triggers can be found even using the user goal technique, which is the technique that we're going to be using as well. But it's not the central part. You know, that in the event decomposition, it was the central part uh, of identifying them, whereas here it's more just thinking about, well, what, what might spur this? Uh, it's a, a little more descriptive. Uh, the brief description, which you already have, uh, the actors, these are straight out of your use case diagram. So recall, you know, you, you'll have done your use case diagrams before you do this. Um, and you'll, you just refer back to the diagrams when you're listing out who the actors are. I'll tell you that the benefit to that is that if you jump right into this, you might say, boy, it feels like we're kind of repeating a lot of work here. Why are we doing the use case brief descriptions and then we're doing the use case diagrams and now we're doing this? It just feels like a lot of repeated work. No, there actually is a method to the madness. And the method to the madness is that um, it allows you to think big before thinking small. You guys probably all heard the term, you know, you, you lose the force for the trees. In other words, you're nitpicking the details so much that you're forgetting the big picture of what you're talking about. And if you jumped right into these, into these fully developed use cases right away, there's a solid chance you're going to miss some of the bigger things. Like you might not even, you're so wrapped up in what exactly the use case does, you know, from a process perspective, that you might not realize, oh man, I didn't realize there was this other actor involved. <laughs> and that's definitely something that'll slip through the cracks. So if you think of the big picture first, and you're thinking of, okay, just, I'm not going to go into the details of what exactly this is yet. But I know this is something that happens, and I know these people are involved. It, it allows you to think big first, and then you can get in. So please don't think that you're we're just doing busy work and repeating things over and over. There's a method to this as, as to why we do it this way. Um, all right, so kind of like I said before, stakeholders, uh, anyone uh, with an interest in, in the use case, uh, the preconditions, what must be true before it begins, post conditions, what must be true when it's done. Uh, and then, as I said, one of the biggest contributions of this particular step would be the flow of activities. A lot of the other stuff is repeated from, from prior things that we've done. Uh, you just put it in a more formalized, singular document. Um, but the flow of activities really is an addition. Uh, you're really expanding upon just that, that brief description. And these can be quite long. You know, don't think they all have to be exactly three or four lines long. Sometimes the, the use case uh, flow of activities can be 10 or 20 or maybe even 30 lines long of description. With that said, um, you do kind of have rules of thumb. You know, these, these are not hard and fast rules. Before I get into them, let me ask again, I'm not exactly sure of the curriculum here uh, in any programming classes you might have taken. And I may have asked this before as well, but let me put it back out here. Granularity. Have you guys heard of the term granularity? No, not part of the programming curriculum here. I would say it's of central importance <laughs> uh, because programming is all about breaking a big problem into manageable smaller problems into modules that make sense for the size of what they are. Um, you may have heard the term modularity, uh, perhaps like I want this module to do one thing and do it well. This is from a programming perspective. You don't want a whole bunch of random tasks put into a module because then you get this thing called spaghetti code. Have you guys heard of that term? Spaghetti code. Some of you have, some of you haven't. Okay, well, actually a lot of you have, some of you kind of not. All right, so spaghetti code refers to code that doesn't fall through in a neat and predictable way. It, it points to random other points of the code to jump to under random conditions. And almost all code that was written back in like the 60s and 70s was spaghetti code. 
Um, I know this because although I wasn't alive then, I worked on code that was written then. <laughs> and it was a miserable, miserable experience. Um, fixing the simplest problems would literally take months. Uh, so this, this concept of, of high cohesion, so high cohesion, that, that's that concept of doing one thing and doing it well within a single defined function or module, and, and low coupling. So coupling means I'm, I'm too reliant on other modules to do my work. Um, you know, by definition, modules are linked, right? Because I have one that'll call other ones further down. I mean, so by definition, there's going to be coupling, but there's also lateral coupling where, you know, I may have been called by this one, but I'm gonna look over to this one and I can't function without this one. That, that's kind of a problem. Uh, if, 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 it, if you have this high coupling condition. So the original term that I, I mentioned at the beginning of this was granularity. And granularity refers to the appropriate size of these modules or functions or, or objects or classes, whatever you want to call them, the appropriate size of it. And there's no one answer to that question. There's no, say, they should be exactly, or between, um, 15 and 105 lines of code. I mean, that, that you, you're not gonna say that because you may have a situation where you have a module that works really well that's five lines of code. And you may have a situation where you really need uh, 275 lines of code for a module to do the one thing and do it well. Um, so it's kind of a science and it's, it's more of, I'm sorry, it's kind of an art <laughs> more than a science in determining this and you start to think about that a little bit here. So back to what triggered this whole side talk about basic programming concepts is thinking about that while you're creating your flow of activities can be helpful because you might sit down and say, okay, um, the only thing I can think of is, is this, you know, for my flow of, it just does this. And that might be too granular. In other words, it's too fine of a use case. Is it really more part of another use case? The answer isn't necessarily yes, by the way. You might not say, oh, okay, uh, this one thing, very obviously, it's, it's not a standalone use case that should be part of another use case. But you definitely should sit back and think about it. Or you might say, oh my gosh, there's, there, I have three pages of, of flow of activities, things. There's so much stuff that I have in this use case. Then you think the other thing. Maybe this isn't one use case. Maybe it's multiple use cases that I just kind of glam them all together into one. It just gets you thinking is what I'm saying. And, and a good kind of rule of thumb here is probably, you know, five to 10, maybe 15 or 20 on the outside would be the number of things you should see for a flow of activity. If you get any more than that, it, it, you might need to reconsider the use case as a single entity. I don't want to use that term entity as a single unit, <laughs> as a single grain. Um, or if there's like just a couple, you know, does it, could it fit in something else? So these are the types of things you as a group are gonna be discussing. And then finally we have the exception conditions. Again, uh, these are situations where uh, the, the use case can't complete for some reason. It's described here as where and what can go wrong. And please don't shortcut this. Don't just say, I don't know, let's, let's talk for a minute, and I don't know, maybe they didn't enter the field right, done. Try to be thorough and, and think through every possibility, and you kind of have to be creative here uh, when you're doing it. You have to think of weird situations and weird people doing weird things, because that's exactly how people use software, in ways you totally don't expect. Um, I, I took an advanced programming class um, way back in the day when I was an undergrad, and um, the professor actually wanted us to come into his office while he was grading it. Each one of us individually would go into his office while he's there and we're there and grading it. And I think it was kind of theatrics because um, I couldn't have been the only person that he did this to. But I walk in and he stands up. He wasn't a small guy. He was a pretty big guy. He stands up and he sits on the keyboard to try to break my program. <laughs> You know, just in other words, it, like I said, a little bit theatrics, but would I have thought that he would have done that when I was writing it? No, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. And I guess it didn't break, fortunately, because I had a control on the, the buffer, but um, it was still surprising to see because it got you thinking, you know, people do really weird and unexpected things uh, with software. Uh, and here we see another example, and I don't think I need to go through it in detail, but, you know, this just 
for your reference, uh, when you guys are creating your fully developed use cases, you have some uh, reference examples here, and this one goes through it as well. Um, here's something else we'll be doing at this phase, which is um, the activity diagrams. And these are kind of another form of, and again, I don't know the curriculum here. Did you guys do program flowcharts when you took your programming classes? A couple of you are saying yes, and some of you are saying no. That doesn't make me feel good because I don't feel like there's a standard for um, how you guys learned. Um, okay. Can anyone tell me the three main logical structures in any program? You have at least 150, so you definitely should know this. Are you talking about things such as like classes and then uh, um, methods inside the classes? No. So within, within a method where you have your, your logic, essentially, and it could be in any language, it could be object-oriented, it could be function-oriented, it doesn't matter. Any language, any style of programming, you always have three logical structures. There's three things you can do. Really? I, I bet once I say it, you'll remember, and maybe you maybe just call it something else. So there's, the first thing you can do is sequence. In other words, I do this, and then it'll fall to this, then it'll fall to this, you know, as you fall down code, you do one thing at a time. The second thing I can do is called condition. So I don't just fall down, I have a decision to make. I come down, is this condition true or false? I'm gonna go this way if it is, and this way if it's not. And then the third thing you can do is looping. So I'm going to come back up to the code. Again, it's similar to the condition because it's a condition that I'm checking, but instead of fall, continuing to fall through, I loop back up if the condition is true or false, depending on how I set up that particular condition to check. Those are the three logical structures in any programming language. And this is kind of what you're modeling here with your uh, activity diagrams, are the logical structures. In this example, um, we only see sequence. There, there's no decision points being made. It's, just, it's essentially falling through. And the other tweak here between this and program flowcharts uh, is that it kind of shows this in and out flow between external to the system and internal within the system. That, that, that's the main difference between this and what you might see in a program flowchart. And it's important because, again, for information systems development, you are thinking from a systems perspective, which has this boundary, and the boundary is where the work happens, but there's still an interaction outside of the boundary with these actors and, and whatever else. So here we see the customer. They want something, and so then we go into the system, and we have this uh, thing that's done, which is create customer, uh, which is going to then prompt back to the user, uh, enter an address, and then it's going to create the address. Uh, and these are all the things that you would see inside of the, um, the flow of activities, this thing here. So you're essentially giving a graphical representation of that thing. Um, and again, I'll give you another old saying which you all have heard, a picture's worth a thousand words, and in this case, it is. This is a very helpful thing moving into the next phase, which is design. So in the next phase of design, this is where you really start to think programmatically and you really start to think algorithmically, and you, but you need to have a good basis by which to build that. And looking at this, you could probably, not probably, you could definitely pull out a good design out of this alone. But if I, in addition to that, if I have this, I, it's, it's almost a quicker process because I can look at it and then quickly understand what exactly is going on here and then how I'm going to model that in, in the more uh, specific way that you would in design. Here we see another of the uh, logical structures, uh, which is the condition. So a, a yes or no, true or false type of condition. Um, is the sale item available? If it is, then you mark it as shipped. If it's not, you mark it as back ordered. I just ran into that. Amazon can be so tricky and annoying sometimes, and I'm a total slacker as a parent. I'm sorry, I admit it. I wait till the last minute for everything. I'll probably wait, even though I'm saying this right now, I'll wait till December 22nd to start Christmas shopping. That's just how I roll. Um, so apparently there's a holiday coming up on Saturday called Halloween. 
And apparently kids like to put costumes on. Evidently this is a thing. Uh, so I jump onto Amazon and I find this awesome uh, blow up penguin. My youngest kids always love penguins. And I notice that it says available November 2nd. So that's this right here. Is it available? <laughs> available November 2nd. And I said, oh, that's not good. But it's weird because it didn't say that before I got into the shopping cart. So let's see what happens if I actually try to purchase it. You know, the, the shipping date should say that, reflect the fact that it's November 2nd. So I move forward to the shopping cart and shipping date says October 30th. I'm like, I don't trust you. <laughs> I, don't, I am 99% sure there will be no costume and you'll have the... Uh, like paper bag type thing with like marker on it that I'll try to you know do the terrible parent thing. Um, although I did see a really good one on YouTube, a guy he built a a porta potty that was like about this big, just out of cardboard, and then he put like a, a little like doll's body under his body, so it looked like it was sitting on the toilet when you opened the door. And I was like, I could I could do that. I'm pretty sure I could build that. Um, but fortunately, I was able to find another penguin costume and. My point is that Amazon didn't really do a good job here because they left me, the customer, confused as to what the, what the process was and whether or not I would get this product that I was considering buying. All right, last thing here is CRUD. Uh, again, I think I mentioned this during a lecture once a few weeks ago, uh, but now it's a formal part of what we're covering. And CRUD is an acronym, well, yes, it is an acronym. There's initialisms and acronyms, and I couldn't remember which one was which, but I'm pretty sure this is an acronym. But it stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. And this is something that could actually generate additional use cases beyond what you've identified from your requirements gathering from your interviews. And it's, it, the book describes it as a cross-check against an existing set of use cases used in a database context. So what, what this means, using a database context, what this means is that all of your data is being stored in a database. Every entity that you've identified is being stored in a database. So you need to identify the specific use cases that will put the data into it, that will read the data from it, that will modify the data to it, you know, or update, if you will, and will delete from it. You have to identify specific use cases, and there's probably a 99.9% .9 chance that not every entity has use cases associated that do all four of those things. So in other words, this is a way you're going to be identifying the use cases, which depending on the situation, you may or may not probably will need to double check with your clients. Do you want to be able to delete committees? And if so, what is the case that describes that? Give me a situation, Mr. or Ms. Client, that describes when this would happen. When would you be deleting and who would do it? You see what I'm saying? You, you have to think about these because they may not have come up before. Uh, so here we see an example where you have um, an entity called customer. Uh, for the create portion, uh, there's create customer account. Makes sense, we already have a use case for that. For the read, uh, look up customer and produce customer usage report. So there are existing use cases where you can look up a customer. Probably a uh, customer service rep would be doing that. Um, produce a customer usage report, probably the customer and the customer service rep would be doing that. Update, process account adjustment or, or um, adjustment or update the customer account and then delete, uh, update the customer account to archive. That's something that's interesting about delete. Um, nowadays, it's pretty rare to do a full and total delete. Um, there are always liability questions and record keeping necessities and uh, financial requirements based on legislation that you can't really update anymore. You can just set it flagged to you're not part of the system anymore, which can cause other problems. Um, I know most of you guys probably don't use Facebook other than to talk with your parents maybe from time to time. Um, but there was a big thing with Facebook a while back 
where people will try to, to delete their accounts and then they find out they're not really deleted. And everyone gave a nefarious finger pointing to Facebook saying, ah, you're evil, you're bad. Well, they are evil, but not really for that because them not deleting uh, customers was, well, really they're not customers, they're more of the products. The customers are the advertisers. Um, but the fact that they're not deleting their products slash customers uh, was not necessarily nefarious because most organizations don't do that nowadays. And this is reflected here where it doesn't say for the use case, get rid of the customer, it just says archive them. But it is in essence a deletion. Uh, so the steps you do uh, for a CRUD analysis is first you identify all of the entities. This should be something you've already done uh, before you get to this. You should already have created your entity relationship diagram by now or at least the first step towards it. Um, for each entity, verify the use case exists to create, update, read, and delete. Um, and then add new use cases as required. Identify responsible stakeholders, uh, which is important because you wanna know who's gonna be doing the deleting or modifying or anything like that. Uh, identify which application has responsibility for each action uh, to create, update, and use. So here we see an example of a CRUD matrix where all of the uh, use cases are listed in the first column, and then we have um, the uh, customer account sale and adjustment, uh, create, read, update. Uh, and so where you see the gaps is where you would um, see additional use cases created. All right, questions on that? Okay, let's jump into the test. Um, test number two. Hmm. Sorry, I'm recording and I don't want to put the entire test up here. weird. They've changed the interface on Dropbox. And I don't see an obvious way to download. Hmm. I mean, I guess I could use the web interface, but... There we go. God, they hit it. It's terrible. All right, so like last time, um, or did we have 50 questions last time? Sorry? I think so. Yeah, so it'll be the same. It'll be 50 questions. Um, instead, last time we had four chapters. We had one, two, 10, and 11. Uh, this time we're gonna have three chapters, three, four, and five. Um, and We are going to so let's see 
that would be uh, the intro to use cases, uh, domain modeling, and then uh, fully developed use cases are the three areas. So use cases first. Um, defining in one sentence the, the two techniques used. Um, so there was the user goal technique and the event decomposition technique, so be able to describe each of those. Um, and then the steps, you should be able to remember the steps that you can use to accomplish each of these. And as a reminder, you can use um, one sheet of paper with whatever notes on one side that you want. Yes? So it's going to be the same format we come in with the laptops? Yes. Yeah. So yes. Is it short answer or multiple choice? Multiple choice. Uh, let's see, so back to this. So we talked about the two techniques uh, for the, the identifying your use cases uh, and also the steps within those techniques. Um, you should know those specific steps. Um, some terminology here, uh, you know, like what is an event? Um, what is a system user? The different types of events, if you guys recall, there was um, the external events and the temporal events, things like that. Um, to um, be able to describe the different types of triggers uh, that you would identify for event decomposition. Um, So if you were given an example of a step, you should be able to identify what that step is. Uh, to give you an, an example of that, uh, you won't see this exact one, but something like this. Customer decides to buy a shirt. What is that? External event, trigger, temporal event, or an activity after an event. That'd be a trigger. That's one example. Um, you guys might recall the discussion about perfect technology. Um, you should know what that means. Do you guys remember what that means? Yeah. Uh, define the system's reaction to an event. What is that? I'm going to help you guys out here because this is a tricky question. And I'm going to leave it in too. What is a system's reaction to an event? I'll give you a clue. It's the title of the chapter. It's a use case. Um, System boundary, be able to define that. Uh, not going to do any of that stuff. Um, user stories. Uh, what is a problem domain? Uh, be able to describe the brainstorming technique. All right, so by the way, we moved on to chapter four here for uh, domain modeling. So when I was talking about the brainstorming technique that was related to domain modeling, uh, when I talked about um, I guess I didn't say this, but I was getting ready to. The, the noun technique uh, is another one. What technique? The noun technique. Remember where you go through all of your data and you just try to pull out all the nouns that you think might be an entity that you'd want to store information about. Uh, and then there's the various components. What is an entity? What is a domain class? What is an attribute? Uh, what is a relationship? Um, 
examples of such things. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Like if you were to see um, a person's name or a customer's name, is that an, an entity, a relationship, an attribute, or a cardinality? What would that be? A person's name, entity, attribute, relationship, cardinality. Yep. You guys don't like to be fine. It's a, you think that's like a field that I'd be storing about the entity, which might be the customer. That would be an example of an entity. And I won't be tricky with that. I could be. I could be have like a really vague, I don't know, that could go either way, but I won't do that. I will, not, I will be as clear as humanly possible. Because this is multiple choice, so you either get it right or you get it wrong. There's no, well, you understood it, but you didn't quite get the right answer, so I'll give you most of the credit. It says right or wrong, even if you do understand it. Um, defining that, of course, you know, what is a relationship? Um, the synonym for relationship in UML, or I'm sorry, the synonym for cardinality in UML, <coughs> which is multiplicity. Uh, and then we have being able to identify the different types of relationships and also describe the most common type of relationship. So remember there was the unary relationship where you're related to yourself. Uh, there's the binary relationship where you're related to one other entity. There's the ternary relationships where there's three entities related to each other. And then theoretically there's n ary where you have n number of people related to each other all at once. And the most common one of all is by far, we're talking 99% of them are binary relationships. Um, be able to define uh, what a primary key is and the purpose of a primary key and a foreign key and the purpose of a foreign key. Um, what percentage of entities do you think need primary keys? Yes. What about foreign keys? It's kind of a trick question because yeah. <laughs> the answer is it depends. Uh, It'd be shocking if it was 100%, but possible. Uh, same thing with 0%, possible, but it's very surprising. Uh, it's just if I am the child entity in a relationship, I need a foreign key. So that's it. So it's, if you had a multiple choice question for that and, there, and your choices were 0%, uh, 100%, 53%, or indeterminate, you would choose indeterminate to ask as a general response to that question. Now, if you were given a picture of an ERD without even the foreign keys labeled, you should be able to be able to identify exactly how many foreign keys there would be in that. How many foreign keys are there in that diagram? <coughs> yeah, Jacob's right. He said two. He just looked at all the many sides, and there's two of them, two foreign keys. Uh, There's more definitions. And then some uh, model elements as well, like you should know what the crow's foot represents, what the single dash represents, what two dashes represent, what a zero in a crow's foot represents, um, all those various cardinality things. Uh, how you know in a model whether something is an attribute or an entity name. Um, here's some cardinality questions as well. So if you were to see
this as a diagram on the test. And the question was, Cardinality constraint on the entity indicates that there can be um, zero or many, one or many, many, or it can't be determined. What would you choose? One or many. I'd say pretty straightforward. Um, and also describing, you know, looking at, say, that, if you were asked, is that a binary relationship, unary, ternary, you obviously would say unary for that one. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I, I, I dogged on it a lot, but I, I will be asking some questions. We did go over it. I will be asking questions on the UML notations as well. Uh, you know, so in this case, um, you know, having the the one, they actually had the numbers and the, uh, the one many. So instead of having diagrams, they, they had it a little bit different. So I will be asking for those notations. Um, oh, okay. Uh, how do you fix many to many relationships? Yeah, so you create the, the linking entity in between them. Now this is why it's important to do this before you do the fully attributed use case and the, the CRUD analysis because um, if I say I have a many-to-many -many relationship and I create a linking entity between it, um, doing a CRUD analysis might identify additional use cases that are related to that because obviously I, it came out of the ether. It's not even something that was created as part of my, my noun technique or my brainstorming technique or whatever I used. Um, so you might actually ident be identifying new use cases there. Uh, we're going to skip all that. So there's something, if you're looking in the text in, in, in your preparation for this, um, there, there's a whole section on state machines, which I'm not going to ask any questions about that on the test at all. Um, also, uh, the concepts of uh, like superclasses, generalization, specialization. I'm not going to ask any questions on that either. Uh, that's something we didn't cover in class and I don't think is that relevant to our discussion because we're not using, for the most part, we're not really using UML. I want you to be aware of it and understand the basics of it. That's why I'm asking some questions, but we're not going to go deep into that because again, when is it appropriate? I, I brought this up during the, the process modeling lecture. Um, but do you guys remember when I said you would want to use UML as opposed to the more standard technique? When you know you'll be developing with object-oriented languages. If you know you're developing in object-oriented languages, you probably should use UML because it's a more one-to-one -one transition from your design into um, your development. But when is object-oriented programming appropriate? in very specific things. And again, I brought that up during class. There's very specific things that it works well at. You don't force it into every situation. You don't say, well, I learned with, uh, with Java, which is an object-oriented language, or Smalltalk, or whatever. So therefore, I have this hammer, everything's a nail. No, sometimes you gotta break a screwdriver out, because it's more appropriate to use a screwdriver when you have a screw, you don't hammer the screw in. So, um, when we talk about information systems, which, which is what this class is, it's about developing large-scale information systems. This is not a hard number, but based on my anecdotal experience and evidence and interacting as a consultant in many, 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 many cases, I would say around five to maybe 10% of new systems developed are in an object-oriented paradigm. 90 to 95% are not. Because it's just not necessarily appropriate have I told you the story of CSX? A company that I was involved with a long time ago. Do you guys know what CSX is? It's the largest commercial rail company in the world. They're huge. You know, when you think of rail, you think of Amtrak probably, but Amtrak's an embarrassment. You go to any other country, you'll realize how terrible our rail system is here in the United States for passenger rail. For commercial and freight, we're actually, probably the best in the world. We're amazing at what we do with commercial and freight. 
uh, for rail. The largest company in the world had this old system, their old information system that was developed in the 70s. Actually started in the 60s, but really rolled out big time in the 70s. And in the late 90s, this is when I got involved with it, there was um, this magic bullet that everyone was super stoked about in, in the technical sense, which was called Java. Java, this amazing new language. It's so cool. Everything should be Java. Everything should be client server. Forget these old mainframes and you know 1970s tech with COBOL and all this old stuff. Let's shift everyone over to Java. So they did. They tried to. And they totally failed. It was a mess. So they had to go back to the old way. Java, by the way, is designed around being object oriented. And it just didn't work for the volume of data that they were sending around and the methods and needs and the business requirements, you know, stuff we're talking about now, uh, of CSX. It just didn't work. They couldn't get it to work primarily because of the paradigm of object-oriented development. That was the, the, one of the main reasons why they couldn't get it to work, and they lost tons of money. We're talking 10 figures. For those of you trying to do the math in your head, over a billion dollars is the amount of money lost trying to do this. So 2020, they're still using mainframes in COBOL. And this was in the late 90s that they tried to shift over to the, the new modern hip tech thing. Um, and they're still using the 1970s tech right now in 2020 and doing great. They're actually doing quite well. All right, so, so we're gonna skip all of that. Um, all right, so now we're moving into uh, chapter five, which is the fully developed use cases again, kind of like chapter four, um, I didn't cover everything in the chapter, and so there's, if you're reviewing from that, which I do advise, by the way, I do advise utilizing whatever notes you have, pulling up the PowerPoints, cross-referencing those with the actual chapter, looking at the questions in the back, because if I recall right, the last test wasn't awesome um, as a whole. You know, some of you did fine, but as a whole, it was a little lower than I would have hoped, so take some time. Anyone early voted yet? few of you? Okay. So you have time on Tuesday. You won't be sitting in a four-hour line or however long it takes. You'll, you'll uh, have time to prep for this. And you have no other classes or anything, just this one, um, right? No other responsibilities, just this class. So. All right. Um, all right. So the various components of the fully developed use cases, you should know what each of them do uh, and what they're for. Um, like, uh, what is the, uh, the workflow and what are the preconditions and what are the exception conditions? You should be able to describe those. Uh, here we have more questions about that. Uh, flow of activities. Oh yeah, and the relationship between flow of activities and activity diagrams, um, you should understand that. Um, Sorry, there's just a lot that we're, I'm skipping, like sequence diagrams, I'm not covering that. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions in sequence diagrams that I'm just not including. So this is an interesting question, which I'll probably have on there. Um, what are the primary models from which other models draw information? It's important to know what to focus on. What do you think that is? Use case diagrams and domain class diagrams. Well, problem domain class diagrams, which for us will be ERDs. That's, those are the primary two models that you're pulling information from when you're doing this. Um, we're also skipping, sorry? Diagrams and ERDs? Well, say that again? You said use case diagrams and ERDs? Yes, um, but on a broader sense, um, was it, who asked that question? Okay. On a broader sense, um, the ERDs are an example of these, um, you know, broader domain models. Um, but I, I hesitate to use that because that's also used specifically in UML. Uh, but it's, it's, in addition to that, net generic phrase, um, talking about the, uh, the problem domain and identifying the things. But for us, when, you know, specifically what are we doing? Yes, 
ERDs, and use case diagrams. Uh, all right, the primary purpose of the CRUD technique. Why do we do the CRUD analysis? What does CRUD stand for? Um, what define what activity diagrams are and why we have them. Uh, what do the arrows represent? Um, what are the constructs or the model elements within a an activity diagram? So you have the ovals for uh, specific steps within the activity. Uh, you have the arrows for showing the, the flow of process, and then you have the diamonds indicating decision points. That's the test. I think you all, I, I feel good about this one. I think you all do a lot better. <laughs>